The Technique Series is brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching. Did you know that you can get 100% free form check from one of our expert strength coaches? Seriously, absolutely 100% free. No credit card needed, no questions asked. Just go to barbelllogic.com slash technique and sign up for the free Barbell Logic experience now. Do that right now and then enjoy the show. Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and I'm with Matt Reynolds today. And we thought we would talk about the knees out cue. Uh, it's not just the knees out cue, but also, you know, just the knees out aspect of the squat and the deadlift as well. Like, what, what is that doing? And then why do we cue it? And what is the cue supposed to fix? And all that stuff. Knees out, Matt. <laughs> Uh, this is like your emails, right? Where somebody the emails that you hate, where somebody like just presents a problem and then says, uh, please advise that thoughts. <laughs> You're like knees well, out. Uh, I, please advise Reynolds. Uh, so knees out. We will often cue someone in the squat. Uh, if they have knee slide or they're banging off of their knees, right? In their squat, mm -hmm. we like to see their knees travel both forward and apart track out over their toes for the first maybe third to half of the descent. Yep. And then the knee should be immobilized in space. And then everything else from there is going to butt back, lean over. Yep. So if the knee continues to travel forward all the, as the, the squatter goes all the way down to below parallel, that's what we would call knee slide. And we can get patellar tendonitis and it kills the hip drive. There's a, there's a lot wrong with that. Uh, and then we'll also see people, they got to, you can see it. It's hard to describe, but once you see it, you, you'll never miss it again. When somebody is kind of banging off of the tendons in their knees, they're getting a rebound <laughs> off of their knee to come up out of the hole. Sure. Uh, we'll often cue knees out to fix those things. Yeah. Um, what, when you tell somebody knees out, what are you expecting them to do when you say that? Yeah, from it, an actual, it, not just a practical perspective, but what is actually happening? Is that what you're asking well, me? When I tell somebody knees out, I find that I actually have to clarify this. I mean, act like there's a two before between your knees, holding them apart. Yeah. So they're going to go out over your toes, and then you're going to hold them apart. You're yeah. going to increase yeah, the I distance say out between to your the knees. Sides a lot of times. Like if mm -hmm. if I say mm -hmm. out, out usually works, and then for some reason sometimes out knees out. They don't really understand what that means. And right. so I go push your knees out to the sides, push them ap apart, away from each other. Right, like those things all you'll you sometimes you have to use those cues. And so, yeah, we're actually wanting you to actively drive your knees out to the sides and maintain that. And when you do that, it keeps them from sliding forward in the bottom. And so that that knee slide that occurs, the reason that's so bad, when the knees slide forward in the bottom third of the of the squat, like that last bit of depth. By the way, that happens a lot of times because it's actually far more comfortable to squat, to get the bar to move down lower if I let my knees slide, right? So mm -hmm. it's way tighter on the muscles of the posterior chain, and we'll get there from a physiological sort of standpoint, if I, it's, it's far tighter if I don't let them slide forward. So it's the same thing that occurs when somebody squeezes their chest up in a deadlift step four and they drop their hips. If you drop your hips when you squeeze mm -hmm. your chest up, it's way more comfortable. You've, it's like less blood pressure in your face. Right. And this is the same thing that's occurring in the bottom of a squat. If they let their knees slide forward, they're like, well, that was, it was easier to get down there. Right. That's not what I want. I want to compress right. the spring. And what they're doing right. is they're making it so that they're not pushing in to that circle of tightness, to that bubble of tightness. And so when the knees slide I, the forward. The circle of tightness. That's yes, right. <laughs> When the knees slide forward, the knees also go down. They have to. Right. Right? Because the 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 is the pivot point, the fulcrum that they're on, is that the ankle. So as the knee slides forward, the knee also goes down. And that means in order to break parallel, you have to squat deeper. That's right. The more my shin is vertical, the less deep my hip crease has to be to break parallel. Right. The closer my shin is to vertical, the less deep my hip crease has to go to break parallel. The more angle on the shin, 
the deeper I have to go to actually break parallel. So I end up doing more work often to break parallel, but there's lots more problems with that. The other issues are it closes the angle of the knee while leaving open the angle of the hip when the knee slides forward, which means more moment force on the knee, right? More rotational force on the knee, more moment force to overcome by the quads and less moment to overcome by the glutes and hamstrings. Yep. Because the glutes and hamstrings are closer to the gravity vector when the knee slides forward and the knee is further away from the gravity vector when the knee slides forward. So now I've taken a lot of that moment and I've shifted it from posterior to anterior. And that's a problem because what we're trying to do is use the most muscle mass. And if I'm going to use muscle mass, I want to be able to use the glutes and hamstrings and adductors. Adductors are a big part of this we'll talk about here in a minute. And to do that, I have to freeze those knees. We say freeze, you said immobilize. Yeah, immobilize, freeze the knees in space one third to one half of the way down in the squat. They do not move. They bend, but they don't move around in space. They're at their stopping point. Yeah, your shin will travel forward. Your knee gets kind of out over your toe, and then it stops. That's right. And then the hip, ain't, then the knee angle closes as your hips go below parallel, and then you drive right. back out of the hole. And the knee is immobile mostly as it comes up until you get to about a third of the way up, and then yeah, the sometimes knees are that's exactly right. And some people do this tremendously well, and it's like really frozen. It's just beautiful. Like the knee just does not move. Yep. The whole last 50% of the descent and the first 50% of the ascent, the knees do not move. That's, that's perfection. That's what we're chasing. Um, so that's certainly a big piece of it. And by the way, as a side note, the back angle is set at that point too. Right. So the knees are immobilized and the back angle is completely set at its level of amount of horizontal. So I'm bending over a lot depending on your anthropometry, you know, long-legged, short, uh, torso people are going to bend over more, and, uh, and short-legged, long torso people are going to bend over less, but that back angle is set halfway down. And from that point forward, it's just your ass going back and down to break parallel. You, your ass going back and down into the circle of tightness? Into the bubble of tightness. <laughs> so, so we'll cue uh, uh, knees out to keep that knee from traveling forward. And it seems to, when they get, uh, if their stance is wide enough, if their stance is correct and their toes are out in the, at the proper angle and you cue knees out, when they get to the point where their knees were sliding forward, the adductors get really tight because their knees are out. Yeah. And then, and then that prevents them from sliding forward. Yeah, so I think if we look at this from, let's start from the side plane, that sagittal, look at, it, look at it directly from the side and talk about the hamstrings and glutes and then look at it from the front and figure out what's going on uh, when, we, when we push our knees out, which is to abduct, abduct your knees. Um, and, with, and it also externally rotates. We, we got your ad, adductors and your abductors. Correct. Right. When you abduct someone, you take them away. Yeah. So the abductors take your leg away from the midline. Yeah, that's good. I've never heard that. That's a Hamburg original. Turn it into a little song and we'll sing it in homeschool. Right. So, <laughs> and so, uh, so from let, let's start with the side plane. Well, when the the knees stay back, right? When they go forward and out for the first half of the descent, and then they push out but do not travel forward. The thing that keeps, one of the things that keeps your, your tibia from sliding forward away from the femur mm -hmm. are really two things. One is the ACL, which is not exactly the thing we want to stress. The other thing is the hamstring. The hamstring grabs that tibia, the, the shin bone, and pulls, keeps it from sliding forward. So when the, when the knees stay back and out, the hamstrings are stretched more. Mm -hmm. When they slide forward, they shorten. Certainly, they shorten uh, distally at the knee, right? Now, on the, on the proximal side, the side that's up underneath your butt cheek, the hamstrings originate at the ischial tuberosity there, at the ischium, at that little, at your seat bones, those two, your butt bones underneath, not your tailbone, but on, on, you can feel the pressure if you're sitting in a chair right now or in your car driving, you can actually feel the pressure of your, of your butt bones on, on your sit bones or your ischial tuberosity there. 
And the more I bend over, the more I point that ischium, those that that the tuberosity, the actual bony structure that points out, the more I bend over, the more that actually points back at the wall behind me. So if I hold my knee back and shove it out, and I'm able, because of that, to bend over more, it's just going to stretch my hamstring a little more, which means that my hamstring can then more powerfully contract in order to help with hip extension, which is really what we're trying to do in the squat. So it allows me to better use my hamstrings when my knees go out and not forward after the first 50% of the descent, right? We want to be clear. Right. The knees have to go forward a little bit. Right. Well, any, any person with a, with a, hey, man, I've got a, I've got a client, uh, Todd. Yeah. Not, uh, not, not Todd, my father-in-law, but an online coaching client. Man, that guy has got the shortest femurs I have ever seen. Yeah. How okay. about Will Morris? Oh, yeah? I haven't, I haven't watched him squat. Bro, his torso to femur ratio is two to one. Wow. His torso is twice as long as his femur, whereas your femur is twice as long as your torso. <laughs> this is I'm really not. I'm actually not that long femured. No, you're actually really long shinned. Yeah, your shins are like grotesque. They're yeah. so long. Yeah, a wolf watched me squat the first time, and then he went and sat down and like rubbed his chin, and he's like, "Oh, I finally figured it out. You've got like giraffe shins." <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really bizarre. Yeah, so so when those knees go out, so they slide, they, they come forward just a little bit, uh, and then get pushed out. When I do that and do it well, it allows me to sit back with my hips and bend over and be more horizontal on my back, and that stretches the hamstring more unless the hamstring contribute better to the squat. So that's the first thing that happens. Because I'm bent over more, I'm better able to utilize my glutes, right? That's right. Because the glutes originate at the iliac crest and cross the hip joint and attach or insert or as I used to say, insert with a, hmm. with a Z, and all the staff would make fun of me, uh, at the greater trochanter of the femur, the bony knob that sticks out on the femoral head neck area. So the glutes are really, the glute max especially, the big giant one that your grandma used to spank with the ping pong paddle? No. No? You, didn't ever, you never got spanked with ping pong paddles? No? No. Mm. We might have to do some deep rooted. <laughs> maybe I, maybe I'm the one that needs the counseling. The glutes are really massive. The glute max is a massive, powerful hip extender, which means again, the more the hip closes, the more opportunity the glute has to contract forcefully, and and extend the hip. And this all still comes from not letting the knee slide forward, keeping the knees out. Right. So the hamstrings are better able to be utilized, and and certainly the big glute. And then there are two smaller glutes, the glute medius, the medium-sized glute, and the glute minimus, the small-sized glute. And those are hip extenders and also external rotators. So we haven't talked about external rotation. And at this point, if we think about the squat from the side and we rotate and we go, okay, well, now what is happening if we look at the same guy from the front? When I abduct my knees and my knees get further apart, if my stance is at shoulder width, hip width stance, ballpark area, as the knees go out, the femurs also externally rotate a little bit. So I get external rotation. They rotate away from the midline. So, yeah, if you're sitting in a chair with your feet flat on the floor and you just let your legs fall open, like your right yeah. knee goes to the right, your left knee goes to the left, the femur externally rotated. If you, sure. if you knock your knees together, that your femur internally rotated. That's right. So when it externally rotates, the inside of my thigh points more towards the ceiling. And when it internally rotates, the outside of my thigh points more towards the ceiling, right? It, they rotate internally or externally. Now, number one, when I push my knees out, when I push my knees out, it allows my femur to externally rotate which means I'm able to better utilize those external rotators, which are all those weird physical therapy muscles like the piriformis and the obturators and the gamellus and all of those things, as well as that glute medius and glute minimus, which will help abduct, shove my knees out, and external rotators, the little ones which rotate the femur. But when that happens... What gets stretched? So while the external rotators and abductors are 
shortened and doing their job by abducting and externally rotating, there's a big giant muscle group that gets stretched that's the opposite. It's the antagonist of those, and that is what? That's the adductors. Adductors, that's correct. It's the inside of my thigh. Those are big old giant muscles, right? Uh, and they're, and they're, I think there's three of them there. And uh, the, oh, I'm going to screw this up, the adductor magnus, is that right? I don't know these. I believe it originates also at the ish, at the ischium, right? So the adductor, part of these, are your, it's your groin muscles. It's what ends up attaching to your groin. Now, they don't all originate at the ischium. I'm sure some of you guys are, I'm going to have the physical therapist come in. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that's where it, a big chunk of that originates. So remember, now I've got the hamstrings that originate at the ischium. And I've got the, a big chunk of the adductor originates there as well. And then it comes down, those adductors come down the femur and attach, insert on the shaft of the femur. They do not cross the knee. And what they do is they basically grab the knees and they try to pull them in. Okay, stay with me. <laughs> if the external rotators and abductors, that my ass and my external rotators, if they're able to effectively hold my knees out, if they anchor the knees out, then when the adductor shortens, when the adductor starts to pull because the abductors are pushing against it or holding, trying to hold out against it, they anchor the knees out and the adductor grabs and it contributes to hip extension as long as my knees don't cave in early. Right. And if your knees cave in early, what what do we call that? Women have it. Starts with a V. Remember that term? Yeah, that's the valgus. Valgus, right? It's the knees come in, and when that happens, the adductors, a deductor, shorten prematurely. The knees come in hard, and they're not able. The adductors are not able to contribute to hip extension, and because the knees never go back out, the ex the hip extenders. The hip external rotators, sorry, the hip external rotators and abductors, abductors, they're just lengthened and aren't able to fight against it. So that's a problem. You, all, I often see, I often see a, uh, a double adduction. Oh, all the time. You know, they, they, yeah, they, they start the, in the bottom. Their knees are out, then they come in, then they go back yeah. out, and then they come back that's in right. to lock out the squat. You know, that's exactly right. And so when they go out the second time, um. That the force that drives the knees out should have been driving the hip up. That's right. And so when they came, when the knees came in the first time, they expended energy at the wrong time in the wrong plane, and the, that energy didn't go into moving the bar out of the hole. It, and the back angle, and you know this because every time that happens, the back angle becomes more vertical. Right. They're not able to stay bent over. Right. And this is a typically a female problem, although it's not always a female problem. I've seen lots of guys whose knees cave in on the squat as well. And so, so for those of you guys who are listening that got lost in the weeds, and I'm sure there are plenty, the point there is that it's real important and real complicated as to why the knees need to go out. But primarily, the idea is when the knees go out, and the reason we say knees out is because it allows us to better utilize the hamstrings, the glutes, and the AD ductors on the inside of my thighs all to contribute to hip extension, which is really what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to straighten the hips. Right. My hips are very bent in the bottom of the squat. I want to get them straight at the top of the squat. So I've got to go through that. And when the knees cave in and or slide forward, usually both occur, my AD ductors are not able to contribute to hip extension very well at all. And my hamstrings are also shortened, so they're not able to contract as powerfully. And then often my torso becomes more vertical, and so my glutes are not able to contract as powerfully, which means I don't get to hip drive very much. Instead, I stand up with my quads and chest. Right. Not literally my chest, but it looks like chest drive, and what it really is is that it's knee extension that's contributing. Hey, all Matt here. Again, August 2020, Matt. And I wanted to give a quick update on, we've had a lot of discussions about the relationship between knee extension and hip extension in the squat, as well as really the other lifts. And so, you know, for a long time, we would often talk about hip drive, like what hip drive, drive the hips, and also would often equate hip drive with the hips or the muscles around the hips doing that. And we recognized 
a while ago that the thing that really causes hip drive that makes the hips go up is knee extension and the quads do that. So the quads perform the knee extension and the hips drive up. So the quads are the thing that make the hips go up in the beginning or coming out of the bottom of a squat or at the beginning of a deadlift or the beginning of a clean or the beginning of a snatch or, or any big pull, the knee extension is going to initiate the bar movement. The very first thing that's going to happen is the knees will start extending. And as they do, the bar must come with it. Now, the muscles around the hips, specifically the hamstrings and the glutes, are still doing a ton of work here, but it's mostly isometric. They're holding on for dear life so as to not let the back angle change and become more horizontal. As the hips come up, the hips have to extend a little bit. The very nature of the hips being higher than the knees or the hips rising will cause some amount of hip extension. But the thing that we're primarily going to look at is did the back angle change? So the back angle should stay the same in the beginning of these movements out of the bottom as the knees extend. The knees extend, the back angle stays the same, and the bar moves as the knees extend. And then once the knees get to the point where they're basically done extending, not locked and not straight, but where they've done the bulk of their work, then we start to see the back angle change as the hips start to open up really from that proximal, from that origination end. And they'll start to open and the back angle becomes more vertical. And so, but it shouldn't in the beginning. So as we talk about the relationship of knee extension and hip extension, no, the knees start the movement in the squat, in the deadlift, in the snatch, in the clean, in all those big movements. And the hips are holding on in isometric contraction, the muscles of the hips, and then they open up later. Now, again, there's a little bit of hip extension from the beginning as the hips drive up but it's not very much. And so just wanted to make sure that you understood what was going on when we've used the term in the past of hip drive. It's really quads extending the knees to drive the hips up and the back angle is set. All right, let's get back to the show. Those quads are big old muscles, but boy, I sure would like to use those other three giant muscle groups. Yeah, we want to, by freezing the knee. We want to use those late in the lift, not early. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, man, I find myself using the same cues over and over and over again. Yep. And it's because they work, right? It's midfoot. Yep. And knees out. Yep. I use those over and over and over again. So if you uh, video yourself lifting and you've already kind of solved the midfoot thing, but you see that you have knee slide or your or valgus banging off your knees or the valgus knee, right? Um, uh, the knees out is the thing you need to be thinking. You need to be thinking knees out. You need to be thinking, I've got a piece of pipe between my knees that won't let them come together. I've seen, I think I've seen Carl use the side tubo, right? The side tubo. Yeah. You, so they got to hold it again. So they've got to yeah. make contact and stay there. Yeah. You put a, I like put that. a tubo, the terribly useful block of wood, a foam roller, you know, some, something that you can stand up. That's a couple feet tall Yep. Uh, on the outside of your foot. And you have to hold the side of your knee against that as early as you can in the descent and as long as you can on the way back up. Yeah, that's good. So uh, that, that knees out cue is crucial. And I think between midfoot and knees out, well, you can fix a lot of problems. Uh, let me tell you where it doesn't work, what I found in my experience. So for, if you're listening and you have knee slide forward, mm. knees out works well. Yep. The combination of midfoot and knees out fixes knee slide. And if they need some sort of proprioception sort of then I'll use, a, I'll use a tubo, and I'll usually put it in the front, make them just touch it, but not knock it over, right? Or so with some people, depending on if they have really short femurs, I'll say never even touch the tubo, right? right? If you touch the tubo, they went too far forward, right? But where knees out doesn't seem to work for me is for females who truly struggle with valgus knees. They want to, they know what it is, they know that they need a knees out, Yeah. They just cannot get them out. They're trying as hard as they can. This is where you see that the double abduction or double adduction. You, you see both. You see it all the time, right? Yep. So they're pushing their knees out. They're able to drive their knees out through the entire descent. And the second they bounce out of the hole, the knees come in. And they squat up about halfway up, and then the knees come flying out again. And then they get two-thirds of the way up, three-quarters of the way up, and the knees come back in as they finish their stand-up. Yep. And I have had many, many clients, female clients that I coach 
struggle with this knee valgus and this this cue of knees out just doesn't seem to fix it because they know what they're supposed to do and they're actively trying to do it and it's just not working. So then the question is, if you're listening to this and you struggle with this or your wife or somebody that you coach struggles with this, what do you do? Like, what's the troubleshoot there? We've talked about this with the staff. It's actually been a struggle. So it's it's really hard to fix. It's one of the hardest things to fix, I think, in in all of strength training. I think it's a strength um, issue, right? I mean, it's not uh, so, for some people. You'll find that it is a, a motor skill thing, and that if you can get them to focus on it, use the side tubo. Yeah. Uh, you can bring it to their attention and it'll go away. But I think for a lot of people, and I think I'm actually one of these, it's actually a abductor, adductor relative strength problem. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know, and I don't know, uh, like it's something that we can improve a whole bunch, but I think that for a lot of people, that's just, that's just going to be their burden. <laughs> that's going to be the one that they struggle with for a long, long time. Yeah. I hope you're enjoying this episode in the technique series of the Barbell Logic podcast. You know, at Barbell Logic, we believe that barbell-based strength training is literally for everyone, and that the only thing holding most people back from all the incredible benefits that come from it is good technique and consistency, and we can help with that too. And whether you're just getting started or you've been lifting for a while, it's difficult to know if you're performing the lifts correctly or if there's anything you can do to make your lifting better. We have tons of free resources online from basic how-to videos that'll get you lifting safely and efficiently right away to podcasts, articles, and videos that will help you troubleshoot common errors. All you have to do is visit barbelllogic.com slash technique to see our best technique-focused content in one place. And while you're at it, you can sign up for a consultation with a Barbell Logic coach. This is a free form check and a chance to ask an expert all your training-related questions. There's no reason you should be struggling to get started or to make progress. Check out barbelllogic.com slash technique for more information and sign up for the Barbell Logic experience. Again, it's 100% free. There's nothing better for your training than knowing you're lifting safely, training efficiently, and on the right track. All right, let's get back to the show. So my experience is that if you're someone who, when you get to really heavy weights, your knees start coming in, that that probably is going to happen. And it's truly a strength deficit that probably is going to happen for the rest of your life. But the weight at which it comes in Mm -hmm. will continue to go up. So I've spent a lot of time trying to troubleshoot this stuff. And here's what I found, right? Not everything works for the same person, but here's what I found that works pretty well. Tempo squats seem to work pretty well. And the vast majority of time that I program a tempo squat, I actually really only care of it, about it being slow on the way down. Yep. But on this valgus thing, it's got to be slow on the way up too, which makes it extra hard, which means you got to take more weight off, right? Because most of these people don't have any problem holding their knees out on the descent. Ooh, yeah. I mm, cracked. Mm, hello, puberty. Puberty. Um, they have a problem holding their knees out on the way up. And so we've got to actually slow down the ascent a little bit too. That makes me a little bit nervous squatting really slow. And, and what I tell them is like four second descent and two second ascent. So they're not firing up as hard as they can. They're just coming up at a moderate pace where they can actively think about pushing their knees out. Um, I've, yep, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, four second descent, you know, um, when you're under the bar, you're not qualified to count. That's uh, right. It's too, so, you know, you need somebody one, two, uh, uh, Nikki says one chimichanga, two chimichanga. He uses yeah, right. food right. Uh, all the way down, and then you do three seconds up. Is that what you, did, what you said? Two, two, if it's two a valgus issue, right? Yeah. For normal, like if I was going to have you do tempo squats, I would have you go four second descent, fire up. Right. But for yes. a valgus issue, I would say probably two seconds on the ascent. Man, three gets really long. Three and sometimes long it ends time. up being three anyway. I just don't want them to actively go as slow as they possibly can. So that, um, that slow ascent that slow rising up yeah, out of the, the hole centric phase gives them time to to really think about what they're doing and focus yeah. on uh focus on the mo- movement that's right same reason we use the primary reason we use tempo squats on the descent is for people who struggle with midfoot mm-hmm. and it lets them think about midfoot if they drop too fast they just lose control and they don't know where their balance is but if they're constantly thinking about the balance points why we use those tempo squats the other things that i've used with some success is the hip circle actually, or bands, like you double mini mm. bands and put it around their, around their, um, 
knees, just a, just above or you know, just above their knees, and uh, or a hip circle. And I I like them training with that. And there, my experience has been while I thought it was going to be really gimmicky in the beginning and wouldn't have told anybody that I was I was using these. Um, it, it seems to have a positive effect even at relatively heavy weights if they're wearing it. So at one point I would have my my some of my trainees. Uh, do all their warm ups with the hip circle on, and then when they got to their work sets, take it off, and they would send me like their last warm up, and it would look great. And then they get to their heavy sets, and their knees would still really come in. You go, ah, you know what? Give me one work set with the hip circle. Let me see the difference. And their knees clearly stay out better with the circle on. Like something about like they have something to actually actively push against. Now that tells me it's a motor pattern issue, and not just a strength deficit in their abductors and external rotators. And so I do like that hip circle. That's what I was going to ask. Uh, so, you don't you don't think it's that the hip circle or the the you know the bands around the knees. You don't think that that's strengthening you know, strengthening them. You uh, think it's a it's providing them feedback so they know when they're pushing sure. out. Uh, in fact, I don't know. Okay, I, I wish I did. I mean, I I just um, I it's probably some of both. Like I don't know how much stronger your um, your a B ductors and external rotators can get with this uh, elastic band around your around yeah. your legs, right? Like maybe a little bit in the beginning, but pretty quick because you're not able to titrate up the tension of that thing. Then I don't know how much stronger it makes you, other than it maybe it helps you just sort of get a little stronger and better able to use all of those muscle groups together on a squat, and that again becomes more of a motor pattern issue. Um, and then the other thing I've done with the really problem clients. <laughs> here's the here's where I'm getting exercise selection way by the way I've never done this with a novice I've never had a novice use a hip circle um, occasionally if somebody's got really bad valgus I will take when I go to a Wednesday light day that'll be the first place that I might move to like a tempo squat is on a Wednesday mm. um, but this is all for sort of intermediate people who are already relatively strong and advanced for my extra clients who really <laughs> their knees come in um, I'll have them hip circle and pause squat about three inches above the hole on the way back up. So they descend correctly, sort of in a tempo. And as they come up out of the hole, just as they fire up out of the hole, they stop. And they hold their knees out for two second count against right. the hip circle. Or maybe not, maybe not the hip circle, but either or. And then they finish squatting on up because that's the point that it really comes in. And I think you're really just playing a motor pattern game at that point. You're just trying to develop that way it's supposed to feel um, and hoping that you get some strength benefit from the thing. So it valgus is hard, man. Knee slide, psh, no big deal. I can fix that right away now. And then some people are harder than others to fix knee slide, especially online coaching. You're not there to sort of yell at them you know, in right. real time. But we can always fix knee slide in online. That, that valgus is <sighs> difficult. I don't... I actually, I don't like the hip circle so much. I don't like that stuff. That's why I like that side tubo. Yeah. That's basically, you're doing the same thing. It's pro. Yeah. yeah. You're just using proprioception. Yeah. 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 Well, there's knees out. Now we also will cue knees out in the deadlift. Yeah. Uh, we do that for different reasons. Kind of, although a little bit the same too, right? So there is the that. The mechanics that. apply. I would do want to better use my adductors. I, I want to be able to use my external rotators and my AB ductors working in conjunction with each other to help better um, create a stronger contraction um, for hip extension. Like that's still there. I'm still trying to extend the hip. But what's the other reason we do it that is not as important on the squat? Well, when you grab the bar and you lean over, you, you hump over and grab that bar in the deadlift, you put your shins against the bar, uh, and then you keep the hips high, but then go knees out, where you press your knees out into your elbows, you get to get your hips in a little closer to the bar. Yeah. We get to take a little bit of that moment off of the back. If you think about somebody that's doing a sumo deadlift, think about a sumo deadlift when they're at the top. Their feet are spread way out, and they're making an equilateral triangle almost. Right. Yep. You can simulate that femur angle when you're in the bottom of the conventional deadlift by pushing your knees way, way out, super, super hard, 
So we get some of the advantageous mechanics of the sumo deadlift off the floor. That's right. So you get to get your hips in a little bit closer to the bar. You get to be just slightly more upright and you get to put some adductor in the deadlift. That's right. If your toe, if your toes are straight ahead with a narrow stance and your knees straight ahead in the deadlift, zero adductor involvement. No. Correct. Yep. So if we get our knees out, we can add a little bit of muscle mass to that deadlift. Um, and, if you want to and see as you it, become more advanced, you can actually even play even more and get your stance in a little closer to itself, right? So the, mm -hmm. bring your feet in a little closer to each other, and that allows you to even get more of a, it, it gives, I use the term bow-legged, it's not bow-legged obviously, but it gives that sort of bow-legged look mm -hmm. of uh, heels are very close together, knees are spread way far apart, and then it comes back together at the groin. Um, and you're able to take some of that moment off of the side plane and put it in the frontal plane. Yeah. And that's important because it brings the hips closer to the bar. Therefore, it shortens that. Um, I'm really shortening the segment length, artificially shortening the segment length. Um, and I'm putting it on that on that frontal plane. Um, and it it can handle it a little better. Right. Because I'm able to put it on some more muscle mass. Um, we don't tend to ever feel like we're going to fall right or left. On a deadlift, we feel like we're going to fall forward or backward. Right. Actually, we just had a, dead, a video come out. Probably by the time you guys listen to this, it will have come out on the Art of Manliness channel where we talk about how we took Brett McKay from a 400-pound deadlift to an over 600-pound deadlift, and it was using these techniques. that knee, we take. He takes a very narrow stance and pushes his knees out really hard, and it's because what we're trying to do is bring that, bring the hips closer to the barbell, Yeah, which is the name of the game in a sumo deadlift. In a sumo de If you do a sumo deadlift right... Your back is damn near vertical. Right. And your hips from the side plane, when you look at the side plane, your hips are really close to the gravity vector. And we can play that same game with the deadlift. Now, again, the same thing I just said, we got to be really careful. I don't do any of this with novices <laughs> ever. No. It's just not, it's no need to complicate things, right? We're the, we're the simple guys. We're the guys that want minimum effective dose. But as you start to really drive your deadlift up and get, very strong and or competitive or we're trying to literally lift the most weight possible at the meet then this is the way we do it and since most of our people actually utilize the the united united states strength lifting where you're not even allowed to sumo deadlift then we figure out how to play with the physics a little bit of a conventional deadlift and that's one of the reasons we push our knees out because we get to put more muscle mass in the thing it, it does, and that's and they do teach knees out against the elbows. The difference is that they don't tend to keep walking your feet closer and closer and closer to each other. So don't play right. we don't necessarily teach heels two or three inches apart, which a lot of my advanced lifters will do, including myself. Uh, but the knees are always are are always out. That's part of that uh, step number three in the deadlift setup. So when you deadlift uh, with your squat shoes on, you got they got that heel there. Yeah, that knee that knee gets a little bit farther forward hips get in a little bit closer. Yeah, a little bit, but but now you've ex you've lengthened the range of motion and the reason you're able to do that, the reason the knees can go forward and the hips get closer to the bar is because now the bar is lower on your shin because of the extra 3 quarters inch of heel. And so the bar can stay on your mid over your midfoot and have your knees still go more forward than normal. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. So as the it's because I've lifted my heel up, the bar is lower on my shin. My knees can still go more forward than they would if I didn't have the shoe on. So my hips come a little closer to the barbell, but I've also elongated the range of motion. So there's the sort of physics trade off there. If as an advanced lifter, I pull the shoes off. And again, all of my novices deadlift in their deadlift shoes because I want to use the greatest effective range of motion. I'd rather use more range of motion in the beginning, just get them generally strong. But as they start to become more competitive, we pull those shoes off, bring in the stance, push out the knees, bring the hips closer to the bar and shorten the range of motion. And sometimes that even means rounding the upper back. Right. Another show for another another day, unless you're you and you're just kyphotic and you can't get your chest up anyway. So, uh, but how dare you? You know? Yeah, the, the uh, well, here's the deal. Your foot's on an incline plane when it's in the shoe. You yeah, know, right. You're, like sure. your shoe might have a, as much as a three quarter inch heel on it, maybe, but it's an incline plane. And your foot's over the midfoot, so it's yep. really about half of the distance. The range of motion is really about half of the distance that it would have been. And then you, and then once it breaks off the floor, that once it breaks off the floor, that doesn't make any difference. It's gone. The increased range of motion doesn't matter at that point. 
and your knees farther forward and your hips are closer in. Well, the instant it breaks off the floor, I think you're in a winning, you're in a, you're in a better mechanical position than you were with the flats on. Unless I don't disagree, but you can't just throw out like once it breaks off the floor, like once for a lot of people, that's the thing. Well, you're right. Breaking it off the floor with the correct form is the big deal. And, and sometimes they get it broken off the floor with the shoes, but at that point their back is a hundred percent horizontal, right? The hips and, and shoulders at the same height, the moment on the back is tremendous. And so, um, again, I, I, for somebody that's just trying to get generally strong on the deadlift, I think wearing your shoes is definitely optimal. You bet. General strength. You bet. But I'm playing that physics game to the end for competitive lifters. Right. I'm playing. It's why I round the upper back. That's why I let people round. That's why advanced lifters who are strong, who deadlift 550 plus men and women who deadlift 315, 350 plus. We let them round that upper back a little bit uh, because it shortens the range of motion and it shortens the length of the back. It brings the hips in closer. So if I'm able to keep my hips high, knees out, hips come closer, and then round the back, the segment length of the back gets shorter. So the moment gets less. Yeah. Because moment is angle and segment length. That's it. Right? And so if I can bring my hips and shoulders closer to each other, I have effectively shortened the segment length. So... You bet. And the then, problem with the shoes is you tend to just keep a really long backing. That's why, that's why we always want the shoes on a clean. Right. Because I want to maintain the long ass moment arm on the back for a clean because I'm trying to accelerate the bar because it's light enough to, per, to cause the trebuchet. Well, the more powerful trebuchet, it, it, it's, it's dependent on a long moment arm. I can't right. get a big powerful whip with a short moment arm. But on, the, but on a deadlift that's 700, 800, 900 pounds, I know that it, you get down a slippery slope if you start saying like, well, you know, a guy like Constantine never pulled in deadlift shoes or never pulled in squat shoes uh, because a lot of times those guys are strong in spite of the way they lift, not because of the way they lift. But when you're pulling 900 pounds, that extra half inch, five eighths of an inch actually makes a big time difference. Force times distance. You increase D. Yeah. Two and a half yeah. percent. It's a big more deal. work. It's more work. I'm trying to reduce work for competitive lifters. Right. I'm actually trying to increase work for general strength lifters. So if you're getting generally strong, let's increase it, man. Let's let's get more work in effective range of motion. Perfect. Let's do it. Well, there's knees out. Hopefully that helps. You can go and uh, use your midfoot cue, the master cue. You can use knees out, and hopefully that'll help clean up your your work. Um, we've got to do a little more of a deep dive on the anatomy stuff than I than I thought, but that's that's a good thing, Matt Matt Reynolds. Yeah. Go to Instagram and subscribe there or follow at Barbell Logic and CPRs and announcements and new pieces of content that come out. And, uh, you know, hit a PR because of something that we've helped you with here. Uh, tag us in the tag us in your Instagram post. We'd love to see. Yeah. The Barbell Logic, by the way, we just there. passed 10,000 subscribers last night. 10,000 followers last night. Mm. Passed 15,000 subscribers on YouTube and uh, 10,000 on uh, Instagram. Same day. Uh, that's excellent well there's another show go follow that at barbell logic on instagram we'll make it worth your while and of course you can go check out the youtube channel we've got those little short instructional videos and stuff that you podcast listeners uh, don't get sent to your podcast feed so go check that on uh, instagram thanks